Welcome everyone. Last presentation before lunch. Sorry for that. We'll speak about implementing SREs in a telco with reliability enhancing procedures. So this talk is 100% about using hardly pronunciable buzzwords on stage. I'm not good at that. I'm Romain. Florian will all start with me uh, today. And we want to show you how we have implemented SREs, IDs, and practices, or SRE-ish IDs and practices, into, into our organization with the reps, the reliability enhancing procedures. We present here today, but that's obviously a, a work that was done by many of our, many, many of our colleagues. But before, let, gave me, uh, let me give you a bit of context of what we do. We do not produce a PlayStation, so you don't know us, maybe. We are a telco operator, think AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon, those kind of things. We have about 16,000 employees across Switzerland working on a huge variety of technologies, services, tech stack. We provide voice and internet connectivity so that your smartphone is connected to the web, that you have Wi-Fi at home. We have many enterprise services, customized connectivity, uh, IT support, cloud services, and many things, and we are also delivering the emergency services or connecting the emergency services across Switzerland for our customers. We have quite good market share, uh, as Laura said, number one operator in Switzerland, that's perfect, nothing to add. 50% <coughs> um, mobile and fix, about 40% in uh, IP TV. We are quite often ranked number one in different surveys and tests, so we are definitely the best operator in Switzerland. I'm not biased. But yeah, we are at the SREcon, so let's discuss a bit which kind of user journey we typically produce as Swisscom. Let's take here a simple example. You have Alice taking her smartphone, and she wants to call Bob on his wireline number. Yeah, go figure why he still has a wireline number. But so, user journey, Alice wants to call this guy from mobile to fix. A service like that, we fully manage it. All the tech stack, all the workload, all the connectivity, it's fully done internally in the company. And it's, a fa it's far more complicated than that, but obviously it goes over tens, if not hundreds, of sub-services, of teams. So you need quite many things to serve successfully such a uh, user journey. And yeah, we all know 100% is a front target. And this is kind of fully accepted for such a user journey. Uh, no one ever complained uh, having a drop calls while calling uh, his or stepmother. <laughs> so that's fully accepted. But let's do a slight change on the user journey. No, Alice is not calling Bob anymore. She's calling the emergency service. I think for that for a second, you are with a friend somewhere. There is an accident and you need to call an ambulance. What is the reliability you expect from such a user journey? How many emergency calls can we lose per month? What is the percentage of those calls that can be dropped, knowing that it may have consequences like life of the, or death consequences? So that's the kind of context we are in as a company. So it's a quite complicated context. We have a large variety of services. Something like the emergency call is built on top of everything. We have very complex end-to-end -end chains, many legacy technologies combined with very modern technology, all the tech stack around. Legacy technology, again, they are there, they will stay. There are very high expectations, something like emergency calling, the very high. And the problem that we face is that it's on top of everything. So the high expectation in terms of SLOs goes down the chain. And it has everyone a lot of business pressure. And guess what? Complicated, complex, large-scale outage. 2021 was a quite bad year for us. We had many big outages where we land in the press, not serving emergency call for six hours, for example. Not very good. Quite, quite dramatic. And, and this trigger a program to increase the reliability or to refocus more on the reliability internally in our, in our company. And 
we were part with Florian uh, of this program, and that's where those reps come out. So for two years now, we have been working on imp improving the reliability. But guess what? Incident still happens. Last one, two weeks ago, 40 minutes, no internet. But yeah, there, are, there is hope on this journey. And with that, I end up you. Yeah, of course, Roma and me, we are the ESRI enthusiasts. We said, yeah, ESRI will save us. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, of course, Roma and me, the ESRI enthusiasts, we said, ESRI will save us all. So, Roma, I found the magical solution. It's ESRI, it solves all our reliability problems. But, but Florian, we do already have all those ETIL practices. Why is that not enough? No, 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 Roma. ETIL doesn't give us enough guidance how to steer reliability as a whole. But if, if we would just do that by the book, just apply those processes, fill those templates, and all those things, it would work, no? No, we have to expect more from ourselves and how we tackle reliability as a whole. So, yeah, that's very short what happened. <laughs> Not exactly like this, but yeah, a little bit like this. So what we tried, we tried then to look at the ESRI uh, best practices and principles and take out the one we thought is the most, um, is the best for us, is the most valuable for us. So the first we took is simplicity. So you saw uh, what Roma said, that we have a very complex environment with a lot of tech stacks, with a lot of teams. So we need to break this down to something that we can understand. And we created the service modeling out of this. Uh, we will go deeper into this later. Then, of course, service level objectives. Um, haven't much to say about that. Everybody knows it. It's one of the core. Um, principles of ESRI, and it's related to service modeling. The embracing risk, what Roma said, we can serve 100%, but that's not clear for everybody. So we have to demystify this myth of the 100%. Then monitoring. Actually, we are pretty good in monitoring. We are monitoring a lot of things, but probably not the right thing. And as we know from the service level objective, the right thing is the user journey. So we had to shift this idea what we have to monitor. Okay, so let's take SRE and apply it. Not so easy. It's never easy to bring such change in large organization with a long history. As human, we all tend to resist change. It's valid for me, that's valid for everyone. It's very valid for organization. So when you try to bring a fundamental change or you think about reliability or you embrace risk and all those principles that, that you all know, it's, it's quite difficult. And there are things you need to do. You need to take very simple steps, very simple first step to take people on the journey. You need to motivate your colleagues to follow. You cannot force them, you need to motivate them. You want them to buy in. You need extremely clear communication on where you want to go, the, the vision, the roadmap till this vision, and you need to communicate over and over and repeat the same messages uh, all the time. Obviously, you also need a very strong management support. This we have because we do have incidents, so every incident is good because we get more support. But yeah, we do face quite many challenges on the journey, and I will highlight some of them. We are not the only one who thought, ooh, SRA, SRE will save us all. Many people in our organization thought the same. And what happened is that everyone has, has its own understanding of reliability, its own understanding of SREs. If you take something like the SLOs, I don't read the book the same as someone else. And when you decentrally start to work on things like that without coordination, it doesn't bring you anywhere. So a big challenge that you have here is that the kind of early adapter of a technology, they must come together, they must 
work together and they must formalize what they want to do. Because if not, you are just trying to move slightly left and right uh, the organization, but you have no impact. So you need to come together to avoid this fact that the things you do are not compatible inside the different service, sub-service provider that we have. Operation and reliability, typically for a company like, like us, is not a continuous process. We have a long history of having some dev teams bringing new technologies and then handing over the whole stuff to an ops team. We are now embracing a DevOps kind of culture, agile, all those kind of things, but there is a huge resistance. We are used not to think about operation and reliability of our services from day one, and that's what we need to do. And another point is that legacy technologies are here to stay. We cannot just all go to Kubernetes and all be ever happy ever after. Those technology will stay for a long time. Imagine we turn off SMS. That's a 30 plus years old technologies. What happened to all your two-factor authentications? So we have many technologies like that that are here to stay, and we need to improve on those too. And what we realize is that we needed a, a strong common language on reliability, a common way of working on our reliability. And this is why we have invented the REPS, the Reliability Enhancing Procedures. The REP are kind of clearly defined cookbooks, allowing us to scale and measure the implementation of SRE-ish practices and ideas. When you work on a rep, Florian will give an overview of them afterward, you have a clear methodology of what you want to do that is described. You have the clear steps, the deliverable that must be, that must be done, the kind of acceptance criteria that, that the teams are asking. Uh, what, should they, what should they do concretely? You have all the training materials, so uh, scale up videos, and on demo. You have all the tooling aspects that are covered, because again, taking the example of SLOs broadly in an organization, organization like us, we need a tool where we put those SLOs. So all those stuff are covered in, in a package that we call um, a rep. The goal is quite clear. We want to reduce entry barrier for our team to start to apply uh, other way of working, SRE kind of uh, practices. So, yeah, thank you, Roma. So I will go now through the reps that we defined. So um, it was like an iterative process how we figured out um, which reps we should do. So one of the first reps was um, service roasting. I will show it afterwards. And um, then other reps came and always this word service came up and service here, service there. But we looked at our company, we couldn't see the services. <laughs> at least we couldn't see it in data. When, when I asked somebody, what is your service? He made pointing to a box. I asked somebody else, what is the service? He pointing to a process. So the first thing we needed to do, we needed to create a common language and a common understanding and common data structure on what a service is. And this is the basis for all the other reps because we have a clear context where we can execute these enhancing procedures on. We also created the service management assessment, which should help the teams to see where they stand in their journey. Um, there we ask the questions which are executed in the reps. Did you do this? And it's also uh, based on um, service risk level. We introduced service risk level, so the team had a guidance to categorize themselves in the right risk level, where we can also then apply the right reps. Then rep three, service roasting, is all about deep diving in your service, look at it from different perspective, look at it from um, the deployment perspective, look at it from the redundancy perspective. We call it lenses, so you really look deep Probably you also know the C4 model, 
where you go from higher level to lower level to lower level, and you can dig down to the code, and you can to try to identify the risks that you have in your service. And this you can do to the, through the different lenses, which are in some kind operation uh, related. Then rep five, the service level objectives. Yeah, as I said, don't have to say much about it. Also, just again, we need this service modeling before we can apply the service level objectives because the service modeling gives us the clear context on what we execute and what we can expect at the end. Then rep six, service continuity and disaster recovery plan. This is all about RPO, RTO, if disaster strikes, how much time can we lose in data and how long do we, can we afford to bring the service fully back? I would say that's a very traditional rep where we also have a high overlap with ETIL. So the ETIL folks, they know what we are talking about here. Then rep eight, resilience testing in production is about to pull the plug in production and to make the teams confident that they can pull the plug. So if you ask teams, oh yeah, um, what do you think? Can you afford to lose this box or to lose this cable? Then they will probably say, yeah, I think so, yes. Then you say, okay, now I go and pull the plug. Then, <laughs> then they will probably say, oh no, 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 no. Rep two, service availability requirements and reliability design. If you come from a greenfield background, new company, that then maybe this is the most obvious uh, procedure you think you have to do. But for us, it's a little bit a different story because we have all this legacy tech, which is a little bit chaotic sometimes. And we don't need to create new services. We have to create the landscape of the existing services and then we have to roast them. That's why rep three service roasting for us is more in focus than rep two service availability requirements and reliability design. So in rep two, it's all about optimizing reliability versus cost. There is a very nice talk from um, 2019, I think, the, the SRE I aspire to be. And he brings it nicely on point what it means to do ASRI at the end. And at the end, we want to find the right percentage of uh, reliability we have to provide to make the users happy and not to overinvest money. So it's optimizing cost versus reliability. And this is what we want to do here. We want to sit together with the business. We want to figure out what can we afford, which amount of user journeys can we afford to lose. Then we create the reliability design. Then we estimate the cost of the reliability design. And then we can go back to the business. Oh, my reliability design is um, 5 million. Is this okay? I can provide you four nines with it. Then probably say, oh, five million, no, it's too much. Okay, yeah, I can give you three nines for 500,000. Do you want to take this? Then probably says, yeah, I think that's a good value. Rep four, provide service uh, specification and usage instructions because we are producing from lowest level to highest level, we also produce a lot of so-called platform services like cloud, infra, network services. And as we know from the cloud and infra service providers, it's very important to know how I have to use the service in the meaning how I deploy my workload on top, how I make the redundancy concept over availability zones, over regions, or even global, and we have to solve the same problems. We have um, very fundamental network services where you have to deploy your network functions in a certain way that you can get the right amount of reliability. 
And last but not least, REP9, Operation Response Testing, it's focused on the chain when a critical alert is coming in and people have to get active. So as we already said, we are a large organization and sometimes the chain of somebody that takes the alert then calls the team, then this team calls another team, then we have to create a big call and until the right people are reached and all the processes went through, we can lose time. Time which is very crucial when we look at MTRS. And here we try to test this uh, in a dry run. In this talk, we will focus on REP1, REP3 and REP8. There we will deep dive now. So reps are pragmatic, scalable, easy to teach and apply, a common way of increasing our reliability. For us, it was really important to make this scalable, that we can do it decentralized because we don't have the force to talk to 5,000 engineers. Um, we needed just another way to do that. So let us go into rep one, model your service definition. So this is a diagram that was created out of one of these outages. So this is the user journey Roma showed at the beginning, diagrammed as technical components. And behind of every of these boxes could be a whole network, could be 1,000 applications. So it's still very high level. So some people sat down and they created this diagram with the goal to understand the end-to-end -end user journey as a whole and then to find the problems. But it doesn't scale because when they finish the diagram, you can be sure one of these boxes already changed. So centralized managing of tech like this doesn't work. So we have to give this to the teams and enable the teams to document their service in a standardized way. And this is the basic language we came up with. So on top, we have the offerings. Then we have the services. The services is functionality. There we express the functionality somebody can consume. On the service, we get the data feature and user journey. A user journey supports a feature. So to say, this is also about structured data. First, we have to create this common understanding of the primitives. Then we can get structured data based on this. And when we have structured data, we have a lot of possibilities in terms of automation, of machine learning, and so on. On the bottom, we have the resources. This is where our functionality is implemented. This is what forms the service. And uh, on the right, you can see this dependency graph, and that's our reality. We have these huge dependency graphs. Service depends on other service and contains resources, and we, we need to be able to understand this landscape as a whole. So let us look now at the mobile voice basic service as an example. So the mobile voice basic service is contained out of physical devices, network functions, applications, and so on. And the gray box is the service boundary. And the service boundary is very important because we can give accountability on the service boundary. We can then say, hey, you are accountable for this service. Oh, application one is in your service, so you have to roast application one. A service also contains the features. The features are the highest level of structured functional description that we have. Under the features, we get the user journeys. And yeah, you know SLOs and how important the user journeys are. So this is the foundations for the SLOs at the end. And the implementation of the functionality that we express over the user journeys is implemented in the resources. 
As I said, on this scope, we can apply them service roasting or we can apply the SLOs. And we have a clear contract between the teams and between everybody which is working on reliability. So let us look now at my service. I'm in my team and I'm the service owner for this service. So we have now clear accountability and everybody has the same understanding. Doesn't matter if he uh, provides a network service, a cloud service, or a service running on Kubernetes, function as a service, doesn't matter. We have clear boundaries. Then my service depends on other services and these other services are modeled again the same way and the reliability interface between these services is now the SLO. So we have this clear segregation of accountability where the reliability interface between the services is the SLO. And of course, other services depend on my service because we have this graph, this service graph. And what we now can do, we can tell the team, look, here we have the reliability enhancing procedures that you have to apply on your service to get better in reliability. They are accountable to execute them on my service. So rep one is about getting structured data on our service and resource landscape that we can tackle the problem systematically. Um, Florian said it already a couple of times. So this rep one is the base of quite many things. We had a lot of discussion, a lot of cases where we realize we cannot go forward because of this service modeling. So in an, in an industry like ours, having a model that allows us to break down the services into small pieces is really a key to, to move forward. Now I will focus on two other reps that uh, we also apply on our services. The first one being the service hosting. This is not something we invented. There was a talk <laughs> on how to improve your service by roasting it. Here in Dublin, SCRECON 2016, that's where we took the, the ideas, the inspiration for, from. And as we did with the other rep, we focus on formalizing a bit the expectation for the team, the training, the template, to again make, make it as easy as possible for them to embrace this, uh, this service hosting and, and work on it. Basically, three phases. But it starts with a very clear service description exactly what Florian was speaking about, what are your user journey, what are your boundaries of your service, and so on. And then you gather the people of the service, of the neighboring service, the one you depend on and the one that depends on you, and together you start to create some kind of big pictures. You create a big picture of your architecture, and then you have to apply different we call that lenses on those big picture. You take a view, what are the deployment that we have for those various boxes? What is the alert flow for those uh, different boxes? What team is responsible for, for which part or which person, which monitoring tool do we use for which cases, which resources? Because again, remember, we have a quite complex tech stack covering many technologies and they are not all monitored the same way. So here you take the time to update your understanding of your service. You generate those different pictures with different lenses and the first benefit already here is that you get a common understanding on all those kind of big services are produced. Then you roast it which basically mean for every line, every box, every arrows that you have on those services, you ask yourself the question, what can possibly go wrong? You write that down, and then you start to ask yourself, what is the blast radius if this error occur? What is the probability that this risk rise? And with all that, you get a map of your risk. So axis, impact, and probability, and this is quite good because when you want to start working on reliability, you can start top right of this picture. So with that, you create a list of your risks that are classified, which could basically also be used to compute the effect they have on the, on the SLOs. 
Third phase, continuous improvement. With that, you know, define for the top risk measures you want to implement, reliability features you want to add into your service, and this enter your backlog. And here's some magic. It fully fits with what we do with uh, SLOs. If your error budget policy has to be activated, you know exactly what to do. You have to prioritize those features. So with the service hosting, you also get ready to use SLOs correctly as they should be used. And yeah, that's, that's quite good because it's also create a lot of transparency through the organization, more internal customers, on what should be uh, done or what will be done on a service to improve it. Um, next one we wanted to deep dive is the REP8, resilience testing in production. Florian already mentioned that. Quite often I go somewhere, I ask a team, do you trust your service? They always say yes. Can I go in the data center and remove a cable? They say no. We are not used to test in production. People never did that. We never touched production to do some testing. And this is what we change with this process of resilience testing uh, in production. It's different steps. It's taking quite, uh, quite a lot of time. Um, I was attending one of those um, exercises a couple of months ago, and it was quite interesting because the team was turning off a node serving 10% of the customers, and they were doing that laughing having fun. Because the six months they spent ahead of that, preparing for the test, led them to a position where they trusted the service enough so that we can go in a data center, remove a cable, turn off a power supply, and they know nothing happens. And that's exactly what, what we do in that. Another example is typical user, um, typical kind of connectivity that we have here. At the bottom, all the radio, uh, all the antennas spread across the countries. It goes up for the user journey of our transport networks over four data centers that do different kind of processing, not really important, and then goes to our internet. And we wanted to test what happened if we disconnect one of those data centers. And we did everything needed so that we could go in the data center and disconnect the gateway that we have at the directly connecting to the transport network. And we did that. We do know those kind of stuff. We, do, we go in our data center and we remove cables. We want our teams to trust their system enough so that they can um, do that. So, but what about the ETL guys now? Eh? Nice, shiny, SRE features. So, continue. It's okay. Just. Uh -huh. Okay, so um, yeah, we shouldn't lose the ETIL guy because um, he also wants to have a seat in this whole story. And the point is that uh, the reps can be moved over the ETIL practices. They help to concretize the ETIL practices. It's not that they fight against each others. With the reps, we help to concretize the ETIL practices and to move the system together so that everybody can feel comfortable. And that's the reality today. We are working closely with the uh, operation department together, which still follows a traditional ETIL flow. And we say, oh, this rep can help you to improve this practice. And we fit it together. And in this assessment, everything comes together. From the practices, we have the non-functional requirements, which says, oh, you have to do this and that. Then we say, uh, between, here is the practice, you can fulfill this non-functional requirement. And then in the assessment, we can assess what is um, fulfilled and what not. So all good now? Not really. Not there yet. Um, Many teams still see those kind of activities, those kind of changes are some administrative overhead. Things they have to do, they don't want to. What we realize is that we need to communicate very well. You need to discuss in Bila with the colleagues to convince them we have to change. This requires a lot of energy. Um, tracking the progresses is very hard through the complexity of our organization. 
and we still lack quite a lot of um, learning sharing between the teams. This we don't know yet, uh, we don't do yet well enough. So there is still uh, a lot uh, of things to go, but we have already seen that having a common language is extremely powerful. You can go around in an organization with kind of 5,000 DevOps, and when someone says, I'm working on Rep3, everyone know what the guy is doing, what is expected, who oh, is doing that, where this is going to be documented. And, and this is extremely powerful and is helping us quite a lot. Yeah, I also oh. want to say something to this. <laughs> um, yeah, um, recently I was talking to a team and then uh, they said, oh, I have to do this reps, uh, management said I have to do this and that. And I was just realizing we are now in the same position as the ETIL guys where they said, oh, you have to do this and that template. Then I sat down uh, together with them um, and I explained what is in with the reps for them. And yeah, I just realized we have to explain it way better to the teams because we fall into the same trap that other policy framework were falling before. We are not recognized as value add for the teams. We are just recognized as this other thing they have to do on top of all the business features. So our learning was we have to do videos, we have to explain them because the only uh, way we can scale is making videos and blog posts because as I said, 5,000 engineers is just a too large amount that we can go directly to every team. Yeah, and this leads us to the last slide. Um, we are considering kind of open sourcing what we do or publishing uh, those reps in more details. If, but we don't know if is there is an interest on that. So if yes, reach out, would help us um, so that we, we can share that with the community. Thank you for, for your attention. And yeah, again, we will be around, so don't hesitate to contact us. Thanks. Thank you.